So we're going to do a very quick prezo about the the um, the squid app approval for the uh, ocean guard stormfoot and jellyfish, uh, and then if you have any questions, we're just going to go straight into them as well. So it shouldn't be too long a presentation. In terms of what we're going to talk about, this is basically it. Very quick overview of what SquidEP actually is. Where is it actually applied? Uh, we're going to provide an overview of what the approved devices are. Um, we're going to do an overview of the studies uh, that we have submitted for each of the technologies that were submitted for the SquidEP review. Uh, we're going to give our perspective of what the SquidEP experience was like. Um, and then what now? Uh, what have we got planned for in the future as well? So first up, what is SquidEP? Um, Long story short, oops, sorry, I'm back, backing ahead. Jumping ahead, sorry, um, SquidEP. It is an acronym and in, in our industry, we love acronyms. Um, but SquidEP is the Stormwater Quality Improvement Device Evaluation Protocol. Um, it's a, a protocol developed by Storm Australia uh, to essentially assess the performance claims of various devices. Um, I, I believe including proprietary and non-proprietary assets, uh, but to date it's just been focusing on proprietary devices. Uh, but yes, there was an overwhelming need in our industry uh, recognised for a long time that the performance claims of various devices should be appropriately tested and demonstrated and because um, it saves a lot, councils a lot of time and energy, um, provides a bit more clarity to our industry as well. But if you want to know further information in relation to SquidEP, uh, just jump on that website there, uh, provides all the information you could ever possibly want to know. Um, so where is it actually applied though? Uh, so. I'm based in Brisbane, Michael is based in Sydney. I Ocean Protect work all, all up and down East Coast Australia and South Australia, um, and a little bit of w, in WA and, and NT as well. But I think predominantly it's it's mainly Southeast Queensland and, and a few select councils. So Gold Coast City, Ipswich City, and Sunshine Coast Regional Council all require um, for any, any proprietary device, they must have a SquidEP uh, verification from Stormwater Australia. Uh, so if you want to do a put in a DA uh, and want to propose a proprietary device, you have to have a SquidEP verification for that device or devices. In Brisbane City Council, uh, that requirement will also be in place uh, by June the 10th. So again, come 10th of June across Brisbane City Council for a new development, you will need a SquidEP approval for your proposed proprietary devices. In, um, and and I, I suspect what we'll see in Queensland as well is, um, at, at least based on historical, um, uh, I guess, uh, evidence, uh, a lot of councils generally often follow Brisbane City Council. So I'd expect Logan Council, Moreton Bay Regional Council, uh, and possibly others to follow uh, in time. Over what period? Not sure. Uh, in terms of New South Wales, uh, the Aerotropolis, a um, uh, development area in Western Sydney does require SquidEP uh, verification. And also Blacktown City Council, if you look at their um, WUSA developer handbook, I believe, um, they do require SquidEP approval for any proposed new devices that they haven't already approved. Blacktown City Council also put on some additional requirements as well uh, for any new um, devices to be approved. Their current approved devices still remain, but if you want to have a, a new device, you have to go through SquidEP and then do some additional requirements um, to the satisfaction of Blacktown City Council. Uh, in other areas, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, we heard, hear sometimes whispers from various councils that they um, do sort of look towards SquidEP, um, but to the best of my knowledge, um, I don't believe there's um, any councils that are currently requiring a SquidEP verification uh, for proprietary devices. However, I could be wrong. If, if anyone knows of any, just let me know. Uh, I'd be very keen to uh, um, uh, know. Any comments, Michael, before I dive on to the next? Look, not really, Brad. It's probably more just really a, a new thing in New South Wales here. We haven't been following SquidEP for too long. Too long and um, it certainly has been around on the Gold Coast there for, you know, over a year now. So, yeah, it's um, it's fairly new territory here in Sydney. There's only a couple of counts, one council and, and one region. Um, but I think it's sort of watch this space. I think, uh, you know, if, if we look at what Blacktown's done, I think it's smart. Um, they recognise there's some shortcomings in any technical standard and they put some additional criteria on, which I think is, you know, real clever work by those guys there. Cool. Uh, moving on. So uh, I guess, uh, and I'm going to do a very quick overview of our uh, approved um, technologies now. So uh, the th we've got three 
Squid Ep approved technologies, the Ocean Guard, the Stormfoot of Peace Orb technology, and the Jellyfish uh, filter. So very quickly, first up, Ocean Guard. Um, what is it? It's basically a gully pit basket. So the Ocean Guard Squid approval is a, has a 200 micron uh, filter bag in there, but the, the galley basket or the Ocean Guard itself can be integrated into um, new or existing um, galley pits. Uh, there's a range of different um, uh, sizes, configurations, um, and very commonly used as a pre-treatment device to capture you know, uh, litter or gross pollutants uh, and sediments and attached pollutants as well. Commonly used in combination with our storm filter technology uh, or jellyfish technology or often filter bioretention systems downstream of the ocean guards um, and you can see what they kind of do um, they're applied in a whole bunch of different land use types um, very common in commercial industrial and also high density residential areas and other uh, types of projects the photos you can see here show the um, you can see it's a, it's the the burn resistant bag, the 1600 micron bag that we commonly use. Um, but the squid up approval relates to the um, ocean guard with the 200 micron bag. Um, bunch of different configurations, like I said, uh, they generally are uh, integrated into galley pits, but can be integrated into um, uh, uh, pits to take pipe flow as well. Uh, and look, there's there's no shortage of performance monitoring studies to demonstrate that they work really well. Um, there's four real world published studies uh, there's two peer review reports, and now obviously it's squid up approved, but historically it's been used um, and approved by a whole bunch of uh, councils across Australia for many years now. Um, the maintenance is very simple. Uh, the maintenance requirements are outlined in our uh, uh, operation maintenance guideline for Ocean Guard, which is on our website, um, but pretty simple. Uh, you can remove the bag manually and, and, and empty the contents or use a vacuum sucker truck. Uh, occasionally, uh, the bag might get damaged, you know, someone throws a lit cigarette into the bag or something like that, it can burn a hole. Um, but so occasionally they might need to be replaced, but it's pretty simple. Uh, and like I said, we've used, the, uh, there's a lot of these stopping a lot of pollution uh, going into Australian waterways and downstream devices. Uh, at last count, and this is a little bit old, over 28,000 installed across Australia. Uh, very easy to specify. Uh, you can obviously get ocean protected to do the modeling, uh, et cetera, but generally it's where you've got a galley pit, you can put in a, a um, Ocean Guard. Cool. Uh, we can dive straight into Storm Filter if you like. So Storm Filter, this is the other the, the approved um, uh, technology uh, certified by Squid Ep. Um, so what is it? It's, I'm gonna show a little video in the background, but basically if it plays, there we go. It's a radial treatment technology. So how does it work? Water comes into often a chamber or a pit or something like that water will enter the cartridge media environment. And when water gets up, up to a certain level above the hood, the, the float is activated and water is essentially uh, discharged from the bottom of the hood. So water is obviously draining through the filter media, getting treated. After the water level uh, drops below a certain level, it activates or, or breaks a siphon at the top of the uh, hood, uh, which activates uh, what we call uh, scrubbers to uh, agitate the surface of the uh, filter media and basically help clean, help clean and maintain the longevity of the filter media. Uh, a, a very old, very uh, widely used and uh, uh, co commonly applied technology, which is based on a whole bunch of R&D uh, and probably what 20 something years of experience, both in Australia and overseas. Michael? Yeah, yeah, and I think, look, it's, you know, this, there'd be approaching, I think, somewhere between or around 300,000 cartridges now in the field, as you said, for 25 years. The, the technology this in itself and the way it functions is, is, is quite robust and it does deliver high performance. So what have we done in this case versus others? We've changed the media blend like we have done with Stormfoot of PFAS. We've, we've effectively taken the same vessel and the same cartridge and we've just changed the media to get a higher performance benchmark or target a different pollutant. So that's effectively what we've done. So um, by changing the type of media and also the specific flow rate, we can get a significantly different outcome for a range of pollutants. So still same tried and true technology, but with a spin, with a tweak to enhance its performance. Cool. Um, and like I said, it's very similar ocean guard, commonly applied for commercial, industrial, uh, and re particularly high, resident, high density resident, residential areas as well. Um, 
a bunch of configurations, three different cartridge op options, um, often integrated with into on-site detention structures, a um, whole bunch of different ways um, to integrate these things, uh, obviously predominantly underground. Um, there's a lot of data to support their use. There's uh, to date four real world published, uh, publicly available studies on their performance. Uh, two peer review reports, uh, one longevity study, um, and obviously it's been approved by a bunch of councils for a long time and now could have approved. All of those studies are available uh, in that uh, review paper, uh, which is available on our website um, under the storm filter page. Um, maintenance is very simple. Again, the guideline uh, for the maintenance guideline outlines are requirements, but it's pretty simple. It's like a swap and go bottle system, uh, gas bottle system. Uh, basically, come in there, take away uh, the spent cartridge and put in a new one, and we take that that used cartridge back to our facility and we can refurbish it, take the media out, and reuse the cartridge components again on a, on the next job. Um, so very very simple and straightforward. Um, and yeah, I think these numbers are a little bit old. I think Michael said over three hundred thousand. Uh, installed overseas. I think at last count in Australia, we've installed over 35,000 ourselves. Um, so it's been around for a long time. Very easy to specify. Again, you can just get Ocean Protect to um, do the modeling and design um, or do it yourselves uh, with our assistance, if you like, um, often specified as a single node or a, or a, or a chamber uh, on a drawing, pretty simple. Uh, so that's the storm filter. The last one I wanted to talk about is the jellyfish. Uh, again, our third and our final uh, device that's currently approved under Squidit. Um, this is a membrane filtration system, uh, similar to the storm filter and that's commonly used underground, but how does it work? Basically water comes into the device. Uh, it, 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 uh, the maintenance axis um, where uh, pushes or can capture a whole bunch of floatables. The water is then forced down um, uh, into the, I guess, the below the water level. Uh, there's a separation skirt around the tentacles to help isolate uh, debris and sediments, et cetera. And water is essentially pushed up through the, the membrane tentacles. Um, and water basically goes up through those tentacles into what we call the backwash pool. And, and then it can spill over a little weir before discharging downstream. At the end of the uh, cycle, well, any water within the backwash pool is can be essentially returned back through the cartridges or just gravity fed down into the cartridges to provide a, a basically a backwashing uh, mechanism to help maintain longevity of these cartridges. Any of that sediment that might have been on the outside of the um, uh, cartridges, a lot of it does fall to the bottom of the chamber and can be cleaned out by a sucker truck, et cetera. So again, lots of options, lots of different configuration types, uh, very, very similar applications uh, to the other devices. Commonly used, um, in particular for the jellyfish, is that it's commonly used where you've got a, a hydraulic um, constraint. So very little uh, head loss across the system. Um, like I said, bunch of configurations, offline systems, um, and these numbers are just straight out of our um, design manual, but all that, all they, uh, all, all these numbers mean is basically uh, chamber dimensions, but also number of high flow cartridge, cartridges and number of back flow cartridges as well. Um, in terms of data, there's 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 studies available uh, again publicly available uh, on our website. Uh, two peer review reports, uh, both of which are in that report, you can see on the right hand side, um, and they've been approved by a bunch of councillors for a long time now, and again now Squid App approved as well. Uh, the main, it's, pre it's pretty simple. Uh, a minor service is just, uh, you can see our Southern Regional, Southern Regions Manager, uh, Damien, um, showing how to maintain uh, jellyfish. Uh, look, so a minor service is just rinsing the cartridges and removing any pollution uh, that might be at the bottom of the chamber. Uh, and a major service would be just um, replacing the cartridges every two or three years or so. Uh, but all those requirements are outlined in our maintenance guideline as well. Uh, I did a count on this just recently, 20, over 2,300 now installed since 2017. Uh, 2017 is when uh, Ocean Protect took over the um, license to um, manufacture and sell uh, the jellyfish. Again, very easy to specify, just like the storm, storm filter. Generally, dots on pages, chambers on pages. Uh, if, you have, if you have need assistance, obviously Ocean Protect can do all the design drawings and modeling as well. Cool. Um, so that's a, a crash course in the technologies. Let's now talk about the studies that we use to essentially 
support their claims and essentially go through the SquidEP process. So SquidEP requires, I guess, uh, a study for any of the technology to demonstrate how it works uh, and how efficient it might be at, at uh, removing pollution. So the Ocean Guard study, um, it, this was done uh, in in the uh, campus or the car park of Kingswood, uh, sorry, um, Western Sydney University um, in Kingswood. Um, it was monitored uh, for, uh, um, for between March 2020 and June 2021. So 16 events. It was a single ocean guard, 200 micron bag with a treatment flow rate of 20 litres a second. Um, if you're keen to know more about the study, uh, those review papers I mentioned before, they're just on our website, um, which includes the documents I referred to earlier. Um, the study, the peer reviews, the journal papers, et cetera. This study, before we went to SquidEP, to the official SquidEP review, we actually got it independently reviewed by uh, one of the SquidEP reviewers, um, separate to the SquidEP process. So just to make sure we had we we're confident that it would basically pass. Uh, we got it independently reviewed and they said, yep, it's all compli compliant with SquidEP. And then it went through the SquidEP process. Um, but in terms of the, the site itself, this is the, uh, the, the an aerial view of the site catchment and, and site location. So you see the, the catchment discharging into the device. Uh, the device itself is sort of there uh, and next to it is a, is a fancy cabinet um, with a whole bunch of very fancy monitoring equipment, taking inlet samples, outlet samples, storing them appropriately. Um, we can communicate with the um, with this uh, system remotely to time the sampling um, frequencies, depending on predicted rainfall, um, ex um, rain intensities, durations, et cetera. Um, measures flows, rainfall, et cetera. Um, and all samples would be collected by um, independent groups. I think in this case it was ALS, top of my head, um, and then sent to their laboratory for analysis. So this is where the R&D team get uh, very snazzy with all their um, technical ex expertise. Uh, and obviously the samples are then collected by someone else as well. Mm. Cool, the storm filter study um, uh, was a little bit uh, further away. This was actually done in a place called Zigzag in Oregon um, qu quite a long time ago. Um, uh, 16 events, uh, collected um, between 2012 and 2014. Uh, it was a single, um, what we call a 460, one of our smaller carts, uh, which, and with P-sorb media in, uh, in the cartridge itself with the treatment flow rate uh, of 0 0.86 liters a second. Um, again, the study and the peer reviews uh, uh, and additional studies of, of the uh, storm filter are all available on our website under our review paper. This again was peer reviewed by an independent expert, uh, one of the SquidEP reviewers before we actually went through the SquidEP process to make sure it was compliant with the SquidEP. Uh, long story short, they said, yep, it's all good. Um, and then we submitted it to SquidEP uh, for uh, official review by Storm Australia's reviewers. The study site itself is some aerial photos and some photos um, uh, of, of the site and the system. I don't know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a road catchment. Um, yeah, similar setup in terms of monitoring equipment, in terms of rain, rain gauge, measuring flows, taking samples, et cetera. Um, uh, the jellyfish study um, was uh, in, located in West Ipswich in, in Queensland, monitored uh, again a, a long time ago, 17 qualifying events. It was, you can see that it was a jellyfish 1200-2-1, which means two um, uh, high flow cartridges and one drain down. That's the treatment flow rate. Again, the study itself is publicly available. Uh, we've tried to be as transparent as possible, it, completely separate to the squid um, process. Um, the studies themselves are readily available um, for review if you want to check them out yourselves. But long story short, each of them are obviously the jellyfish, storm filter and ocean gutter, all three um, real world uh, studies looking at a range of storm events um, and assessing the performance of the device in the real world. But again, the review papers are there if you wanted to check them out yourself. Um, these are some um, images from the report itself, um, showing the study site and the, I guess, the, the monitoring system layout. Again, monitoring or taking samples of inlet and outlet, uh, measuring flow, measuring rainfall, um, et cetera. And obviously samples are collected and then sent off to a lab for analysis. Um, cool, sorry, Michael, I've, I've charged through that. Any, any comments or? Look, probably the only thing is that the, the the sampling at Ipswich is different to some of the methods that we would have employed in the in the aforementioned ones for for storm footer and ocean guard. Um, obviously, ocean ocean guard was set up by by Ocean Protect. Um, the storm footer was set up by 
by Contech and and that study itself has been basically the cornerstone of their approval at Washington State Department of Ecology for enhanced phosphorus removal. So it's quite a comprehensive study, again, done by Contech, which we use similar methods to them. And Ipswich has different methods, again, which wasn't set up by us, but but a third, another organisation. So there is some slight nuances between, but essentially all three comply with the Squid App protocol. Sure. Um, the Squid App experience. Um... Just to give you some perspective of what we've gone through, I guess, over the last couple of years. So first up, you got to pay money and then you submit your, uh, uh, sorry, pay money with your form. The, the initial form is basically just saying, this is the name of the technology. This is the claims. We're keen to get it reviewed. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of information that we provide to demonstrate compliance um, with the SquidEp criteria. Uh, some reporting, describing the methodology of the monitoring and the results. And we also, for each of the technologies, we outline exactly how uh, the studies comply with the, the SquidEp criteria. And there's a lot of criteria within SquidEp. There's basically at least 70 uh, individual criteria, and I won't go into them in, <laughs> over in the, the time we have available, but long, long story short, there's a lot of criteria. And we basically said, okay, that's how we comply with that criteria. That's how we comply with that criteria and so forth. And there's a whole bunch of supporting information, what we call individual storm reports. Uh, you can see kind of, I guess, a, a, screenshot, of, a screenshot of one, uh, like that's a, a hydrograph uh, showing flow being recorded, rainfall being recorded, and then you can see the influent and effluent sample for, uh, intervals as well. So we provide for each event, uh, something like that, um, plus a certificate analysis. So basically the lab results, um, independently done, obviously, some chain of, a chain of custody documentation in terms of who picks up the samples, um, who, how, how they arrive, when they arrive, sign-offs, left, right, centre, then a whole bunch of photos and drawings. Uh, we outline how uh, the, the maintenance requirements, basically from the maintenance reports themselves. Um, and then there's obviously, uh, there's sampling and monitoring equipment. Uh, we need to demonstrate with reports, again, uh, how they've been calibrated and maintained. Then there's statutory declarations um, around, uh, you know, what's our role, what's our conflicts of interest, et cetera. Um, and with, all, with that information, we also provided additional studies to support um, uh, the, uh, the, the main study, I guess, including the peer review reports, uh, such as the ones I've mentioned before. So long story short, a lot of, a lot of information. Um, Absolutely. And if you look at just, if you think about just one storm result, just, just one result from one storm, probably equals about 20 pages of, of paperwork that's attached to it in, you know, the chain of custody of sampling, in the analysis, um, in, in the hydrograph, in the data, in text file or PDF from from um, you know from the sampler, so there's a whole heap of information that goes into each individual storm, and you know reporting on this in SquidEp just in a nice tabulated format is the easy bit. It's the 200 pages that sit behind it that really gives the reviewers the understanding of of you know how robust the results really are and can they comply with the standard itself. There's a phenomenal amount of work that goes into each study and the reporting side. And I guess from our perspective, trying to provide as much transparency mm. as as possible, not just, oh, yeah, we got this result, trust us. It's this is the result and here's all the supporting information demonstrating that the event was appropriate, what complies with uh, the script criteria, uh, these are the lab results, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, that's um, our, and that's probably our point. We say, don't trust us. We want you to scrutinise... Mm every bit of information that, that that comes across their desk and we want them to ask questions. That's that's why we're there. We want no one deserves a free pass, even OSHA Protect. And you know, all the all the detail is in these back end reports and results, which determines, yeah, whether it should pass or fail. Um, so a lot of information, but I guess probably the the biggest probably I guess bugbear from our perspective was just how long it took. Uh, just to go through the squid up process. So there's a lot of obviously work involved in doing the study, compiling, collating, and analyzing all the information. And then when you're ready for to to submit to squid up uh, for sorry to submit for the uh, squid up review, it just took so long. Uh, at least for the Ocean Garden storm filter. So we submitted this. The timeframes there are given. Um, but yeah, we submitted this back in January of 2022. Now that is yeah. Um, 25 months ago, two years ago. Um, it took, what's that, about nine months 
uh, before we even met for the first time with the reviewers to basically as a kickoff meeting to give some background context, et cetera. Um, now, it then took several months before we got any sort of draft joint report. Um, uh, so there was a whole bunch of things in that draft, those draft reports, and, and they're, I think they're publicly available um, on the Storm Australia website, and I'll show that in a sec. But um, we provided some responses to those reports, um, but there was clear, from our perspective, there was a lot of points of um, disagreement um, between what the reviewers, the, the first reviewers were saying and what we uh, were, were saying. Um, so because of that sort of disagreement, uh, it was decided collectively to go to a, a separate independent third party uh, review, which is basically part of the Storm at Australia process. And that review was initiated by, um, uh, sorry, in September. Um, and the third party reviewer was a guy called um, Dr. Baden Myers from the University of South Australia. And uh, long story short, that review was completed a few months later. And subsequently the Squid Out verification was issued for um, both the Storm Filter and Ocean Guard. So long story short, it took nearly two years between submission and uh, the verification uh, being issued, um, which is obviously a long time. Um, the, the jellyfish, thankfully, was, was less time consuming. Um, we submitted that in June 2022. It did take a long time before the review started, um, but at least when it, after it started, I think it's fair to say that the the reviewers uh, moved fairly quickly, um, and a uh, long story short, the squid verification was for the jellyfish was issued um, uh, shortly after, which was great. Um, it's a very thorough process. We still just because it was quick doesn't mean it was wasn't very detailed. And I think Mark and Mark Lee was Mark Liebman and Bade Myers were the reviewers there, and they did a very good good job to go through everything that. Um, uh, that, like I said, like a lot of information, um, but came to a conclusion, uh, like I said, in November last year. So come come the end of last year, we had, um, yeah, three uh, approved Squid uh, approved technologies. Just to give some con context or a comparison. So this is straight out of one of the, um, that's straight out of the uh, Squid verification report um, for the Ocean Guard. You can see that the, the column in the left, in the middle shows what we claimed as part of our original submission. And the column on the right shows what we, the, the, that the third party reviewer in Baden Myers determined. So the TSS, TP and gross pollutant claims were, were essentially verified. Just Baden said, yep, what you're claiming is what I, I, I agree with. The TN removal claim um, was downgraded, um, and that was because of just the removal of one event. Um, the event was uh, an event that actually complied with all the SquidEP criteria, but it was considered an outlier uh, from Baden's perspective because the TN removal was 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 high. Um, so Baden thought it was appropriate to remove the TN um, results from that event. Um, now. We personally, I personally didn't think that was appropriate, recognizing that, we, that the event completely complied with SquidEP. But, and also whilst that event was, um, had a high TN removal, we also had to include, we also included events that had TN concentrations decreasing across the device. So the effluent sample showed a higher TN concentration than the influent sample, which is potentially physically impossible. But regardless of that sort of not being, um, regardless of, I guess, doubts as to the validity of the TN results for those events, we included those events. So long story short, we whilst we included events that were certainly not good from a, a, a performance claim, um, the one res one event was removed in terms of their TN results, which meant that the TN uh, approve, uh, uh, TN removal went from the 41% claim uh, to 25%. And I think, and I think that, sorry, probably just highlights, I suppose, probably some of the inadequacies with SquidEP. I think, you know, the reviewers need some sort of guidance when when the data looks different or, or not atypical as they'd expect, especially with that our life of that high removal, then I think some further guidance, guidance to the reviewers, um, I think would be worthwhile because it would have saved us a lot of time and, mm. and, and, and some questions and bits and pieces because, you know, you could sit there and argue, as Brad has said, you can, if you take out the high removals, you should be taking out, or the highest removal, you should be taking out the lowest removal. 
So, but I think that would just help the reviewers um, in their task in, yeah. in getting these reviews done. Yeah, yeah. And Baden's task was difficult. Um, mm. I think he did a really good job in assessing the huge body of evidence and come, you know, the disagreeing uh, positions of the previous reviewers and us and and um, yes, but it, certainly some clarification around issues like this uh, would, I think, certainly benefit uh, further reviewers. And I guess guys like us um, uh, submitting for verification as well. Um, the storm filter and very jellyfish uh, reviews were, or the uh, results were far more straightforward. Essentially what we uh, claimed was what was verified um, for the storm filter and jellyfish. So yeah, like I said, nearly two years later, the, the verification was basically as per our claim uh, for storm filter. And uh, again, the verification, uh, uh, the verified percentage reductions for, for the pollutants was as per our claim for jellyfish. And again, these, these, these are just extracted straight from the evaluators report, which are publicly available as well. And I talk about these publicly available information the verification certificates and the uh, reports, the reviewers' reports are all publicly available on, on that link uh, there. And don't worry if you don't take a screen grab of this, I'll show all, I'll provide all the slides on our website tomorrow as well, but that's uh, easily found. But just in terms of the verification certificates, I'll, I'll show you some uh, extracts from them now, just to provide you a bit of a summary. Um, so for my mind, there's probably two key things in each of the verification statements. Number one, it shows you the uh, pollutant reductions um, and the associated treatment flow rate. So uh, each of the technologies, uh, it's been determined that you should use a generic treatment node to model them. Um, and you can basically specify the percentage reductions using that uh, the transfer functions within the generic node. But it, as part of the generic node, if you're familiar with music, you have to specify a, a, a high flow bypass. So this basically says, this is for the ocean guard, um, the percentage reductions um, for the device uh, can be claimed up to flows uh, up to 20 litres a second. So if, if you've got 10 litres a second, 15, 18, 19, you can achieve those percentage reductions. But as soon as the flows get above 20, any excessive flows above 20 litres a second essentially go untreated. Consistent with, I guess, the uh, typical operation of something like a, a device like this. The other key thing, sorry, Michael. Sorry, yeah, the only change to that, Brad, is really this is per... Ocean Guard go Ocean basket. Guard. Yeah. If you had 10, it'd be obviously sure. 10 times that 20 litres a second, it'd be 200 litres a second. Yeah, yeah, no, good point. The other, so yeah, first thing it, it shows how to model them in music and the percentage reductions and the trim flow rate. The second thing it does is outline the, um, the maintenance requirements. So, but long story short, and this applies to each of the three technologies, the maintenance requirements are as per Ocean Protect's typical um, recommendations, which again are publicly available. Um, so that's pr a pretty important uh, in, from my perspective. So there's no fancy gold plated uh, or extra maintenance required for any of the devices uh, in, in addition to what we typically recommend to, uh, to appropriately model these devices as per the square verification. Storm filters, um, so the storm filter is a little bit more complicated to model, but equally the verification statement is quite detailed. And that's probably deliberately because um, there's a, probably a lot of ways you can model storm filters incorrectly and potentially um, overestimate the pollution removal of the devices. Again, this is per car per cartridge, but it's, 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 it's important to recognize that storm filter comes in three different cartridge uh, types. So you need to accommodate the different uh, flow rates, the extended tension depths, et cetera, for each of the three cartridge heights. Um, and the verification statement basically outlines exactly how you should be modeling this in music uh, in terms of both the detention node and the generic treatment node. Again, the other thing it does is outline the maintenance requirements, which again are as per typical recommendations. Michael. Yeah, and this is, remember, this is specifically for storm filter with the PFAS media operating at a specific flow rate. So unlike other cartridge filters, we have approvals for all three different heights, but it's specifically for the set specific flow rate that we have and also this media blend itself. So, you know, sort of watch this space. There'll be other, you know, storm footer blends of media and specific flow rates coming under the under the squid up guys, but this is just for this specific blend at this point in time. Cool. Uh, very similar story to the jellyfish. 
how to model in music, maintenance requirements, et cetera. Uh, and again, all, all these verification statements are available on that website at the bottom right corner. Um, but I guess in summary, uh, so yeah, Ocean Guard, Storm Filter, Peace Orb, and Jellyfish Filter are all now Squid App verified. Um, the Squid App uh, verified pollution reduction, so just as per our submitted claims, except for the Ocean Guard tan removal, like I mentioned before. Uh, and it's important to note that these are available to, sorry, these, the verification and performances, et cetera, are applicable to all available configurations for each of those te technology types as per the verification certificates. Um, the Squid App verified treatment flow rates are as per the submitted claims, um, noting that the, the treatment flow rate for the Squid App approved storm sort of peace orb is different to what our standard has historically been. Um, but again, the key, another key thing is obviously, as I mentioned before, the design um, procedures, the installation procedures and the maintenance procedures are as per typical o Ocean Protect recommendations. A couple other points is um, you don't, uh, for the storm filter and jellyfish, whilst they can be used as a standalone device, they can obviously also be used with pre-treatment upstream. The Squid App verified numbers are, are consistent regardless of either scenario. And also, to the best of my knowledge, the Ocean Guard galley pit basket is the only currently uh, 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 Squid App approved galley basket. So it's, like I said, the, the Ocean Guard galley pit basket is, to the best of my knowledge, this might change tomorrow. Uh, currently, it's the only Ocean, uh, sorry, it's the only galley pit basket with a Squid App verification. Yeah, look, and Brad, I think it's a great point. I think, you know, if you look at Ocean Protect, we're the only company with Squid App approval for not one, but two different types of cartridge filter um, and also pre-treatment of those cartridge filters. So you can use that Ocean Guard in front of Stormfoot or Ocean Guard in front of Jellyfish to give you, I suppose, um, you know, more basically a more efficient design. So you can buy all those products in-house from Ocean Protect and get a complete solution just from the one company. Cool. Um, in terms of the modeling options, um, there's obviously, a, it's, it's obviously changed a, a bit, but the, the modeling options almost don't change in terms of what you can do um, in terms of, obviously you can just ask Ocean Protect to do your modeling for you. No obligations, uh, free, uh, very quick turnaround. Um, you can ask Ocean Protect just to provide the music nodes with the, with the Squid App uh, approved numbers. We can also provide you our spreadsheet calculators. There's a little screen grab you can see on the bottom right hand corner of the screen there, which uh, outlines how, how you can um, specify various parameter values. Um, or you can just develop your own uh, music nodes based on the Squid App uh, verific verification statements uh, on the uh, Storm Australia website. And even if you do that, you're welcome to get us to check your, or review your models and designs, um, uh, however you see fit. Cool. Um, so what now? Uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, from your perspectives uh, as the listener or attendee, um, Ocean Guard, long story short, long story, uh, Ocean Guard's jellyfish and storm footer piece orb can now be specified where squid out verification is required, including areas like the Gold Coast, Ipswich, uh, Sunny Coast, Aerotropolis, et cetera. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is also the fact that uh, we have already submitted two other devices for Squid App review, one being the Filtera bioretention systems, and there's a photo of one you can see um, on the bottom there. Uh, and we've also submitted another device for Squid App review. And uh, I believe those reviews are just about to start, which is awesome. Uh, and look, separate to all this, uh, the R&D team uh, with Michael, uh, Warren Jones, Blake Ellingham and uh, Jim Lenhart aka the godfather of stormwater uh, they will continue uh, doing a whole bunch of r d um, uh, behind the scenes um, so uh, stay tuned for that so that's all uh, i had to cover today if you've got any questions you'd like to ask michael or myself uh, now is your golden opportunity to do so uh, if you have any questions please put them in the q a uh, but if there's none, we can uh, bid each other adieu and um, enjoy the rest of our days. 
so generally this time I'm you're normally bombarded with uh, questions. Uh, uh, I see a couple of hands raised. Uh, uh, Lee, if you want to put your question in the, the Q&A, that'd be great. Um, as a question that's come through, and apologies if I mispronounced your name, uh, from Vipitu, 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 Vipitu uh, Rajawat, fantastic name. Uh, they ask, have there any of these products been used in South Australia? Absolutely. Um, yeah, our, our uh, South Australian um, representative, uh, Rob Denise, will be aghast that you're not familiar with a whole bunch of his uh, <laughs> projects. Uh, I'm sure Rob's uh, tuning in and uh, he's probably um, uh, fell, falling off his chair as, as this question has been asked. But uh, yeah, we've done a lot of work in South Australia. Uh, literally, as we speak, uh, I believe there's a very large uh, Solterra bioretention system being installed in um, in uh, Adelaide um, used to treat stormwater and recirculated lake water, which is very exciting. But yeah, look, there's a whole bunch of uh, jellyfish, storm filter, ocean guards, um, ocean saves. A lot of technologies have been put in, in South Australia for quite some time now. Yeah, Rob's been down there for, for quite a few years <laughs> in a former life with one of our competitors, but now with Ocean Protect, with his boots on the ground. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure his ears are, ears are burning right now. Cool. Um, hey, I haven't got any other questions. Uh, if you'd like to put it in the chat, oh, here we go. They cut. Uh, um, Brad, I was going to say, I think you've knocked it, just bowled everyone over, Brad. I think you know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben, ben, I know, has been, uh, Ben Wolfgram has been attending Hi, ben. a lot of our uh, fundamental series. Uh, he said hello, which is lovely. Um, but uh, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to put it in the chat as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. No questions from the floor. I, this is the first time it's ever happened. We, we, mm. Yeah, we're a bit lost here, aren't we? <laughs> hey, look, uh, oh, here hang we on, go. We've got Jude. one. Oh, oh, hang they, on. They always oh, come here through. we go. Just when I threaten uh, hanging up, <laughs> uh, Jude uh, uh, from now, Jude, I can't remember which county you're from in South Australia. Jude, um, it's Onkaparinga, I think, by memory, isn't it? I'll, I'll get. I might have got that wrong. Apologies, Jude. Um, do, Jude asks, uh, do you require South, a storm of South Australia to publish this verification certificate? No. Um, storm order, the verification certificates uh, are a storm of Australia thing. Um, that is uh, completely up to them to manage. Um, so storm of South Australia doesn't have to do anything. Um, but you're welcome to uh, uh, let your members know if you like. Um, the link I showed before obviously can be shared. Um, if you think appropriate. It's worth noting that um, I guess, I'm not sure about Storm of South Australia's position on Squidette, but Storm of Queensland, Storm of New South Wales and Storm of Victoria currently have not endorsed um, Squidette in its current form. They have asked for um, changes uh, to be made uh, to improve the robustness of the process. Um, so, but I'm not sure about Storm of South Australia's position on, on Squidep as yet. Uh, ben Wolfgram, his question did come through after saying, being very nice and saying hello. Um, ben asks, uh, I'm, gu I'm guessing you can optimise the treatment flow rate using a treatment train. For sure, you can certainly, um, it's like we've done for, for many years now, there's, a, I guess, having three different technology types, including both um, a, a gully pit basket option plus two different types of cartridge systems. It gives us a very, very powerful position to sort of optimise um, the storm management strategy. Um, and obviously we've got Filtera bioretention systems at, amongst other devices uh, to come up with the best solution for your site. So just because we've got the squid app approval doesn't mean um, cartridges might be the best solution every time. There's certainly gonna be um, horses for courses. And yeah. in areas where there's not, we don't require a squid app approval, for example, um, we'll certainly be looking at um, the, the vegetated options as well. And I think to your, to, to your question, Ben, if if we didn't have the Ocean Guard and utilise Ocean Guard with some sort of a cartridge filter in a treatment train, the, the cartridge filter would be two or three times the size without that pre-treatment. So the pre-treatment is very important in getting the design as efficient as you possibly can. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jude. Yeah, it was Onka Paringa. Thank you. I thought it was, but thank you. Um, Sam, uh, oh, my handball this to Mike, you, Michael. I've been doing a lot of talking. Apologies for that. It's, it's, it's for the first haven't, time. Haven't it's never happened. <laughs> I'm so shocked. <laughs> Sam, uh, Orion Poor uh, asks, um, hi, regarding, regarding the storm filter, when maintenance is due, do they clean the filters on site or do they have to take it somewhere else to clean? 
or they need to be replaced? Do you want to answer that one, Michael? Great question. Love it. Look, we can do both. So that's the beauty of the technology. We can actually, look, if it's a small system and there's only a few cartridges, we can just either pull the cartridges out off their spigots, it's a quarter turn, lift them out with a small crane that we have, have on our vacuum truck, put them in the truck, and we can just then suck out the waste on the floor and then replace them with fresh cartridges. Alternatively, we can actually clean the cartridge out completely on site and we could refill it if we really wanted to. But for us, um, it's it's easier just to basically remove the cartridges, remove the, remove the waste and then put new cartridges that we've at some point in time before um, cleaned, repacked um, and QA'd so we can send them out the door. So it's quite an efficient process and doesn't take too long to change these filters over. Remember, there's over 30,000 of these filters sort of around Australia. So we hold stock of, of cleaned, refreshed use cartridges in our warehouses in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Cool. Um, Toby Bennett asked a really good question. Uh, ha how have these studies and the SCUDEP process addressed the issue of dissolved nitrogen? Was that specifically tested or only total nitrogen? So I might have a crack at this first, Michael, and then maybe okay, handle yeah, it to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look, certainly we, we test for dissolved nitrogen. We, we test for a whole bunch of uh, water quality indicators, including all the species of, of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, et cetera. Um, but currently SquidEP, um, whilst we recognise that dissolved um, uh, nitrogen certainly exists in stormwater and is, is, at, is present at significant um, proportions, this current squid app uh, does not have a minimum limit for dissolved inorganic nitrogen. Now, one of the things that Michael mentioned before about Black Town City Council, um, one of their additional requirements is uh, a minimum percentage of dissolved inorganic nitrogen of 25%. Um, so I, I could, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you which studies comply fully with that, um, but I know at least a couple of them do. But certainly each of the studies uh, have a significant proportion of dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the influence. Uh, Michael, do you want to have any further comments on that? Look, not too much, Brad. It's look, we certainly measure it. Um, it is certainly most more difficult to remove, you know, ammonium um, or nitrate um, or nitrite. It's certainly more difficult to remove, and and yes. We look at that as part of when we're developing media blends in our R&D team. We look at a whole range of uh, pollutants, including you know, ortho P, and, and we specifically modify each blend to optimise the results for a broad range of pollutants. So when we start, so when we develop PFAS, you know, what, 10 years ago, we started playing with the media. It was all about these different pollutants and the dissolved pollutants and, you know, going from a bench scale to complete cartridge sort of utilisation with the technology. So, yeah, we always look at those sort of dissolved pollutants well before we even hit the field. So, yes, all the results are reported. Yeah, and it's worth noting, like, if, you, if, you, if you've got a good memory, uh, Toby, Ocean Protect provided a, b a bunch of commentary and advocacy around Squid App. And, and one of the things that we uh, suggested was that uh, minimum dissolved inorganic nitrogen proportion be included uh, uh, within a Squid App. Uh, the criteria, but that was ignored. Um, hopefully in time that might change, um, but uh, in Squid App version 1.3 in its current form, it doesn't require a minimum percentage of dissolved inorganic nitrogen. But we know yeah. we know it exists. Um, and we know you can you could potentially fudge the numbers by picking a site, doing a bunch, maybe baseline monitoring and having a site with very high proportions of particulate uh, nitrogen and very low percentages of dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which could potentially overestimate your real world results. Because remember, it's stormwater. The magnitude and composition of the dissolved and particular fractions varies from site to site, storm to storm. So yes, you can get sites that have more particulate than dissolved and vice versa. Um, the way that SquidEP works at the moment, which which we don't necessarily agree with is that it treats all those sites the same. So I think that, and, and we know that the dissolved fraction is significantly harder to remove. So that's the one way, the, the one of the flaws in SquidEP, if you wanted to get around it, you would try and find a site with a higher level of particulate 
nutrients to to basically increase your percentage reductions and your verification statement. Cool. Um, that might be a question for you, Michael. I can handball. Um, Braden Diggers asks: Are these typically placed upstream or downstream of of proprietary detention systems? So that's the beauty of having two filters approved being jellyfish and and storm filter storm filter we can place them inside the detention tanks so we don't have to sell the concrete box we can just basically utilize a small area inside the detention system we take up minimal space and therefore we don't really take away from that attenuation volume that you have to hit as part of your regulations or if you don't have detention on site we can sit in you know, a jellyfish system or a precast storm filter. So typically the storm filters go inside the detention and it would be just, you know, in the in the in the inlet area. Um, whereas with our detention, jellyfish can go in for those larger sort of flows that you you may see. Um the 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 BT asks, uh, has any council used the gully pit basket in South Australia? Um I'm not sure about councils actually in South Australia, Michael. Might be a question for Rob Denise. I might right. take that on notice, uh, Vivita. I'm not. I know, I'm sure, I know we've put in a lot of ocean guards on private sites in South Australia, but I'm not sure about a public site. Uh, I know we're doing um, a bunch of filters for a, a council um, down your way, but I'm not sure about gully pit baskets. Leave that with me. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, Braden Diaz also asks, do the councils in Queensland slash New South Wales who require squid app certification also require a minimum reduction in TSS, TN and TP? Um, I, I can have a crack at for this one for a little while, mm -hmm. Michael, but long story short, in Queensland, we have the state planning policy, um, which specifies minimum percentage reductions of TSS, TN, TP for the overall stormwater management strategy, um, not individual devices, um, but the overall strategy. So collectively, uh, you, you can either obviously use a single device or a, or a treatment train or a combination of devices, um, but you, you have to achieve those uh, pollutant load reduction targets for the entire site, not specifically for an individual asset. A very similar story for New South Wales. The, they don't have a state planning policy or statewide uh, objectives as such, but um, they're similar, um, but equally they have percentage reductions for TSTP and TN and gross pollutants for the entire site. Nothing further, Ed, Michael? No, not for that one, Brad. Cool. Um, Domenico Tarabarelli asks, uh, he might, uh, how often do the storm filters need replacing slash cleaning? I'll Mom? take this one. Yeah, sure. look, it's, it is, and let's just, just, I'll just repeat what I said just previously. Every site is different. Every storm is different. There are cleaner sites and dirtier sites. Um, so if anyone gives you just a number, three years, four years, um, they're wrong. <laughs> they're always wrong. It's a range because it depends how big your system is and how dirty your site is. So the range we have for storm for is between, for most sites, between one and three years. Is typically for a storm flood system. We do have some sites that have been six months and we do have some sites that have gone out to four years, but typically one to three years on these types of systems for, you know, a, a residential, commercial or industrial site, typically. But that's one of the reasons why you want to check the mass load, to check the maintenance frequency, um, to basically ensure, you know, you get yeah, estimate your frequency for that site and you can appropriately apply the, the, the maintenance costs and regime for that. Cool. Uh, final chance for questions. Um, just on the, on you mentioned that replacement frequency. Um, we've also done, sorry, we, uh, we commissioned an independent uh, longevity study of the storm filter um, to uh, see how long these devices are lasting in the real world. Uh, that study was undertaken by a consultant called Renew Solutions. They looked at a whole bunch of storm filters at various locations around the Gold Coast, uh, take, put them away, did a whole bunch of flow tests, and they'd been in the ground operating for, I think, between uh, two to five years, and none of them showed, none of them showed any deterioration in uh, hydraulic performance um, in the flow test they did. So, uh, and if you look at the performance monitoring studies of the storm filter uh, in particular, uh, they have been often been undertaken for a fairly extended period of time and showed no deterioration in performance. Um, so again, there's a lot of data to support the fact that they maintain their performance over a long period of time. 
and I think it's probably it's probably the reason why it's the number one selling stormwater cartridge filter worldwide, um, and it's been around for twenty five years. It does have the lowest you know maintenance costs of any cartridge filter, passive stormwater cartridge filter on the market, um, and it's testament to the design of the technology, which was undertaken you know thirty odd years ago. So. You know, we know that we know they work. We know they work really well, and we know we have the the, the lowest maintenance costs with the the storm footer cartridge filters of any other proprietary filter. That's that's why people use it. One of the reasons. Cool. We might cut it there. We've gone a little bit over time, Michael. But thank Ooh. you, everyone, for all the questions, and thank you very much for everyone who's dialed in today. Obviously, we've done a very quick uh, overview, but if you've got any further questions in relation to anything we've talked about today, ocean gas, storm filters, jellyfishes, or whatever you want to talk about, please feel free to reach out to Michael and myself, um, and we'd be more than happy to um, talk further about anything you like. Um, but again, just a reminder, if you'd like a CPD form, please email inquiries at oceanprotect.com.au, uh, and the recording and slides will be made available on our website, oceanprotect.com.au forward slash webinars tomorrow. Thanks again for everyone for dialing in. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Brad.